Hey y'all, Greg Niblock here, the reset button lawyer that, that helps people with uh, bill problems, filing bankruptcy, and uh, making insurance companies pay whenever they get hurt in an accident. Uh, today, we're going to talk about St. Patrick's Day, and I tell you what, you're in for a treat because I, I'm doing this research, I found out some really interesting things. So, I've got my green shirt on, i got my shamrock, so let's get with it. St. Patrick's Day. Did you know St. Patrick was not Irish? Are you kidding me? He's got to be Irish, right? Well, let's see. St. Patrick's Day is celebrated on March the 17th, the day the patron saint of Ireland died. His birth name was Maywin Sukkot and was born in the 5th century and raised in a village called Barnavimta Bernia. Many think he was Irish, but he was actually Roman British. Slave traders captured him as a teenager, along with thousands of others, and were taken to Ireland and sold. He spent six years as a slave in Ireland before he escaped. He was put to work with sheep and pigs in Antum. He was very faithful in prayer to our Lord Jesus Christ, which led to a very strong faith. He started having visions and hearing voices telling him it was time to go. He was able to escape slavery. However, once back home, he was visited by an angel that told him to return to Ireland and save the people. Now a true believer, he trained as a priest and spent many years studying until he felt uh, it was time to go back and preach. Later, he wrote, he deserved to be captured and made a slave because of his lack of faith at the time. The name Patrick means nobleman. And he was in his 40s when he returned to Ireland to preach. St. Patrick was often punished by the Irish Druid pagan chiefs. Remember, we're back in the 5th century. However, he was willing to suffer for the cause of Christ and believed his punishment was a result of his earlier sins. He confronted the Druids at Terra and abolished their pagan rites and is popularly known for converting the pagan Irish people of the 5th century to Christianity. Legend has it that St. Patrick used the three-leaf clover, the shamrock, to explain the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Many believe this to be a myth introduced years later in English writings because there's no mention of the plan in any of the stories from St. Patrick's time and was only referred to later by English writings about the common myth. Legend also suggests that while St. Patrick was enduring a 40-day fast on top of the Hill of Terra, a bunch of slithering snakes appeared and started attacking him. Brave Patrick, however, fought back and drove them all into the sea, banishing them forever from British soil. However, evidence suggests also that Ireland may have been too cold for any type of snake to be remotely interested in, in visiting Ireland in the 5th century. Irish immigration to the United States. Now, that's an important thing as it relates to St. Patrick's Day. America has been a mecca for Irish immigrants since the 1600s. They took jobs in mills, mines, laying railroad track or digging canals, helping build America. And they also helped to defend her as they filled the ranks of her military from the many Irish regiments in the army and to the legendary Irish Brigade itself. Suddenly, in the mid-1840s, the size and nature of Irish immigration changed drastically. The potato blight had destroyed the staple of Irish diet and produced famine. Hundreds of thousands of Irish peasants were driven from their cottages and forced to immigrate, most often to North America. During this time, the Irish were desperate for a better life, yet they were extremely poor. Therefore, their immigration to the greatest nation on the face of the earth, the city on a hill, shining forth the light of liberty. That's right, good old the United States of America. That wasn't easy for them. An example of their deep desire to come to America is shown in the measure of the trials and heartache it took to arrive on our shores. It's called the flotilla of 5,000 coffin ships that transported poor and desperate Irish men, women, and children to escape Ireland. They boarded converted cargo ships, some that had been used in the past to transport slaves sold to the Dutch from warring African tribes and spent every penny they had for passage to America. 
They were hungry and sick and treated not much better than the freight uh, that were on those ships for their 3,000 mile, four week journey across the great ocean. The quarters on these transports were dark, cramped quarters with very little food or clean water. They choked on disgusting air and were showered by excrement, urine, and vomit. Each adult was given just 18 inches, that's a foot and a half, of bed space, and children given nine inches. Disease and death clung to the rancid boats like sea barnacles. Nearly 25% of the estimated 85,000 passengers that began the journey never made it to America. Instead, their bodies were wrapped in cloths, weighed down with a rock, and thrown overboard to the bottom of the ocean, never to see the light of liberty they yearned for on this earth. Although the Irish potato blight receded in the 1850s, the effect of the famine continued to spur Irish immigration into the 20th century. Still facing poverty and disease, the Irish set out for America, where they reunited with relatives who had fled at the height of the famine. Many Irish began to immigrate after World War I. However, uh, there was a decline after Congress began to limit the numbers of immigrants accepted into our country. However, the number of Irish immigrants began to increase again after World War II. Most Irish came and settled in urban areas such as Boston, New York, Chicago, and other large cities. And many of these neighborhoods they established retain aspects of Irish culture, especially centered around the Catholic Church. Living conditions were very difficult, but most managed to survive very, very well. Remember, Ireland was a country of extreme poverty. Thus, although their conditions may have been considered difficult by American standards, it was wonderful compared to where they came from. Irish immigrants often entered the workforce at the bottom of the occupational ladder and took on the menial and dangerous jobs that were often avoided by other workers. Many Irish women became servants or domestic workers, while many Irish men labored in coal mines and built railroads and canals. There was at times disdain for the Irish, and employers would post signs saying, no Irish need apply. Students of history know that unfair discrimination is not new to any one country or society or to any particular people group. Irish culture in America is widespread, though not especially visible as such, except on St. Patrick's Day, when it said, every American is Irish. Words and songs from Ireland have come into common American usage. Common words used in English language uh, with Irish origins include galore, hooligan, phony, slob, and whiskey. St. Patrick's Day is also celebrated with traditional foods like corned beef and cabbage. Corned beef is made from brisket, a relatively inexpensive cut of beef. The meat goes through a long curing process with large grains of rock salt or corns of salt and a brine. It's then slowly cooked, turning a tough cut of beef into one that's super tender and flavorful. Corned beef became synonymous with St. Patrick's Day due to Ireland being a major producer of salted meat, going all the way back to the Middle Ages and lasting through the 19th century. While Ireland produced large amounts of corned beef, it was nearly all for trade because it was considered a luxury and largely much too expensive for the Irish who relied on dairy and pork, especially salt pork, a relative of bacon. In the 19th century, there was a large influx of Irish immigration. While the newly immigrated Irish were used to eating salt pork back home, its nearest counterpart, bacon, was very expensive for them in the U.S. However, in the U.S., a low-cost meat was corned beef. For the Irish immigrant, what was once a luxury became a food that was now inexpensive and readily available. So, it was the new legal immigrants from Ireland that became American citizens that prompted consumption of corned beef that initiated its association with Ireland and the holiday of, you guessed it, St. Patrick's Day. Now, as for pairing cabbage with corned beef, it's simply one of the cheapest vegetables available to the Irish at the time. So, it was a side dish that stuck. 
Now let's talk about the celebration of St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day holiday is really meant to be a religious and cultural holiday. Americans should continue to celebrate this holiday to learn about how their culture has been impacted uh, by the great Irish immigration. And more importantly, it's a Christian religious celebration respecting St. Patrick for bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to Ireland and converting the Druid pagans to Christianity, saving many souls. Cities having large populations of Irish were the ones to celebrate the holiday first. The very first time this holiday was celebrated was not in Ireland, but in the U.S., maybe in 1737 in Boston, with New York holding the first official parade in 1762. It's even possible that it was celebrated before then because in 2017, a Dr. Michael Francis believes he's discovered the first St. Patrick's Day event was in St. Augustine, Florida in 1600. Well, anyway, then other big cities like New York and Chicago followed the tradition. In 1962, Chicago dyed its river green for the holiday, and it's also the day people like to participate in wearing shamrocks or wearing something green. Even though green was never even used by St. Patrick, it was actually blue that he normally wore. But over time, people adapted to the color green, and it seems like it's going to stick. Maywin Succoth was a man God used to fulfill his purpose of bringing light to those lost in pagan darkness and superstition, showing them the way to salvation and the endless love of God and Jesus Christ. This is another example of the natural outflowing of Christianity that changes society and culture for the good. Even while we live in this imperfect world, Christianity does good. Now, Christianity has also shaped the reasons for people coming to the new world, i.e. America, and has shaped our culture, the Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, and the very foundations of our wonderful country. Aren't we blessed? God is good. All right, again, Greg Niblock here, Reset Button Lawyer, and I hope you all enjoyed the St. Patrick's Day uh, video. Uh, And... Just know that I really enjoy doing this, if you can't tell. But uh, if we can ever be of assistance to you in a legal matter, you know, we do bankruptcy, we do personal injury, wrongful death. We, we hope none of this ever happens to you. But if it does, you know, we live in an imperfect world and things happen. If you ever need us, give us a call. And we'd be happy to uh, help you out. And in the meantime, till our next video, hope you all have a blessed day. Enjoy St. Patrick's Day and get you some corned beef and cabbage.